And it was a busy week up in Lansing. Things are certainly uh, back to normal up there. So I wanted to check back in uh, with one of our good friends, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky, at the other end of our line. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Guy. Nice to be with you. And I want to remind you that I, what I told Laura is that you need to find another hobby. She sent me all the bills <laughs> you want to talk about. And I'm thinking, he's got well, too much free time. <laughs> it's, I've been I've been nerding out on some of the crazy things that uh, the Senate Judiciary and House Judiciary Committee. Some of the it, we'll we'll get into that in a minute. But some of the crazy yeah, sure. things like having an out of date decal on your snowmobile, I didn't realize could get you a misdemeanor violation instead of a civil infraction. If you got some folks that are trying to correct that, I guess we might as well talk about it since you brought it up. Um, sure. There really is an effort to try to rationalize some of the laws that we have on the books and I think that's a good thing as you pointed out at the Mackinac conference a year ago we never look back at the laws we passed to see if they're working and that this is an attempt to do that and I think it's a good thing you know when we when we observe something that we think is wrong we too quickly jump to a solution oftentimes overreaching and then never go back to review whether or not we did the right thing the wrong thing too much too little etc uh, I think there's been there's way too many uh, felonies on our our books today, and I think, but I don't think we should do a broad brush. We should do one at a time, evaluate them. What does it mean? And uh, you know, one there's a couple of things to always remember. If government works fast, it almost always screws things up. And if government is acting out of emotion and not out of process, it also can screw things up. Uh, no question about it, and we I think we saw that in Washington with the CARES Act, and uh, there was an awful lot of money thrown at the problem, not all of it very judiciously thought out. Now, I, you know, it's, it's a nice segue to the other thing I wanted to bring up with you. So we got $3 billion sure. from Uncle Sam uh, to try to help hospitals and schools that were negatively impacted by the COVID-19 uh, debacle. We've only spent a couple hundred million of that. Uh, where do you fall on whether or not we can maybe get some more flexibility and apply that to filling the horrible budget hole that we have? Or is that money already spoken for? It's not spoken for, and we have a dearth of creativity because I think the, the conditions that were presented to us when that money was doled out provide for us to, a vote, to a, a deploy it, in, particularly in schools, just about everything spent since March 13th or whenever the date was, the schools were closed down, um, was applied to having asking schools and teachers and organizations to pivot 180 degrees on a dime and start doing uh, learning by through distance. And so as far as I'm concerned, all the effort and all the money that went into executing that was all related to COVID. And uh, I'd love to have that debate with the federal government. If they don't think so, let's have that debate. But that's the, one of the resources that I think we should use to make schools fill the hole for schools in this current budget year. And I believe some of the other money in the, uh, in the CARES Act could be equally and similarly applied. We just have to think differently. Do you think that the, uh, the folks in Washington mm -hmm. would be amenable to that? Because that sounds like c common sense. And that sometimes is in short supply when you head east. I, I maintain this. We make a decision. We document how we arrived at our decision we're prepared to defend our decision and let the cards fall as they may there's no way that as fast as they acted they could have been thorough and complete in describing the conditions for which this money should be deployed i think states should be held in general to the structure of it of uh of the limitations of covid related but man guy just about everything has been COVID related for the last 12 weeks. No, no question about it. Um, yesterday, Senator Ruth Johnson uh, proposed some uh, criminal justice and law enforcement reforms. So did Senator Pete Lucido. Um, I, she would uh, initiate a bill mandating intervention by officers who see wrongdoing by a partner. Uh, Senator Lucido wants to basically ban chokeholds. Are those positive steps, meaningful steps, and can you see that being fast-tracked? I, I do not think it should be fast-tracked, number one. It sh we should okay. not bypass the normal re legislative process. The intervention one, I think it should be something that is uh, part of routine training, and I do think that, that mandate uh, should be supported. Um, but I am very cautious about trying to define what cops 
what kinds of uh, actions they can and cannot do because, guy, you and I don't know what they're going to face next. Now, do I think chokeholds should be used excessively? Hell no. But when you're in a fight, and it is a fight, when you're in a confrontation, your number one job is to win the fight with the least amount of force. But sometimes that least amount of force to win the fight is pretty excessive in the moment. And I don't want to be the judge to tell cops what they can and can't do because pretty soon they're going to be afraid to do anything. And then yeah. it's just like this. If you have a guard dog, if you have a guard dog that doesn't bite, it's just a puppy. We got to have police officers well-trained, well-trained and repeatedly trained. In other words, continuous improvement. But we got to be very careful about telling them what they can and can't do. Well, I, I know you, you've listened to, to uh, Chief Bob Stevenson, former Livonia chief, now the head of the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police, who has said, uh, folks, this is already part of the training. And he also right. said, if, you're not, if it's only going to be for new recruits, then it really doesn't have much force. We should go back and make sure that older officers are taking that. Would you agree with him? I do agree with it. I, I, believe, I believe wholeheartedly in continuous improvement. I also believe that we should elevate police officers, not not uh, knock them down and expect, not very, and, and expect them to be highly performing professionals and respect them in that way. And when there's a rogue cop or two, like we observed, uh, they should get every level of, of, uh, of justice that we can apply to them because that was obviously. But here's another thing, guy. When we, we see have... something like that on TV, yeah, we have MCOLs in this state, the yeah. Michigan Coalition on Law Enforcement Standards. Uh, these mm -hmm. are experts in law enforcement who are appointed. Today, the governor expanded that. She also appointed the director of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission and three community members to be named later. Do you think that's a positive step to get more diversity on that commission? And shouldn't most of the drafting of training regulations be in their hands, not the legislature's? Or do you think it should be a combination of both? I think the legislature is a role in it, but I believe M. Coles and that organization be the, should be the tip of the spear of it. And by the way, having uh, routine uh, citizens involved is a close first cousin to why Detroit and uh, the good chief police and the good mayor in Detroit have been so successful in these last few yeah. weeks and their protests because they've invested and they've got citizens involved in a lot of their review panels and they've basically established relationships. Very quickly, before I lose you, we've got 340,000 people waiting on their jobless benefits because of a fraud investigation at UIA. I, and we heard some horrible, uh, heartbreaking stories yesterday from them, Senator. What can we do to help these people? Is there a better way to do this investigation? The people that they should, they should release the money and then go after the fraud post after the fact, because right now they're punishing 90% of the people for potentially a 10% uh, bucket of it. And it's, a, it's shameful to hold them back because of that excuse. Yeah, and these are people that have already been punished in a variety of ways just having to try to get through uh, to UIA. Senator, have a wonderful weekend, won't you? And thank you so much, and uh, we, we sure appreciate your time, sir. You're welcome, sir. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, Senator Mike Shirky.